First of all, uh, let me thank Eli for inviting me to this um, meeting. And I was just looking at the at all the talks and the list of talks about energy efficient computing, and uh, clearly it's very very impressive. And I suspect, Eli, you, you didn't invite me to talk about energy efficient electronics because I don't know anything about it. Um, but I thought I'll give a talk about um, about infrastructure. And so if, if you want to take a break from energy efficient electronics, this is a good time because I'm not going to go there. But here's a few things I'd like to mention. Number one is uh, if you look at um, energy use. This is the annual electricity consumption. I'm, uh, I think it's cutting off a little bit. In, in terawatt hours. This is the total electricity use in uh, terawatt hours for the United States. And this is a log scale. And this is U.S. data centers. So it's about roughly 2 to 3 percent of the total electric electricity use. But it's, this is flat and this is growing. And the growth rate is going down, primarily initially because of uh, reducing the energy consumption, cooling, and all the other rest of the infrastructure. But that is sort of tapering out. So the only thing we can now do is what you are, all are doing, is to make it much more efficient. This is a big deal in Google. And I'll, I'll show you only two charts from Google. And then I'll go into the infrastructure. This is a big deal because this comes right from the top, um, from the real CEO, is that we want to be carbon neutral. And so there are three steps to that. Number one today is to reduce energy consumption through efficiency. And this is important because it saves money. It's purely business reasons. The second is that that's while that is important from the business side, there is a um, there's a corporate culture that is also there, which is trying, can we transition towards uh, clean electricity? And we use a lot of electricity, and um, rather from getting it from coal-fired power plants, we'd rather get it from clean sources of electricity. In fact, we worked with utilities to introduce things called green tariffs, which is a different tariff structure from the rest of the uh, electricity so that we could then uh, promote clean electricity. So we, we use the demand that um, as a buyer to look at clean electricity. But it's not just, and the rest of it, we look at carbon offset, et cetera. But it's not just that. That's on the purely computing side, data center side. There's more than that. And this is where real dollars come in. This is, uh, the Google has invested about a billion dollars in two years in various project finance and to look at electricity. And, and this is uh, where, whether it's solar or, or, uh, or wind or high voltage DC transmission. And this is just the United States. We've now gone overseas and invested in South Africa, and we're going to do more. So there'll be a lot more dollars going into um, clean sources of electricity. Now, when you talk about computing, I talked about this US electricity use and the electricity used in data centers, there's an inherent assumption that you all know about is that all the computing that we do relies on, a, on an infrastructure that was laid out starting about 100 years ago. And that's the electricity infrastructure. If that crumbles, everything else crumbles. So it's sort of, think about derivatives, <laughs> what happened in 2008. And the, electri the computing infrastructure that we have is a derivative of the electricity infrastructure. So it's really important to pay attention to the electricity infrastructure. And frankly, not enough is paid um, you know, uh, to that infrastructure. So I'm going to talk about that and show you some opportunities out there. Hopefully, some of you may think about that as, as a research topic. So this is the infrastructure that I'm talking about. This is the United States. I'll talk about scale, about the age, the reliability, the security, and of course, climate issues, and things like energy technoeconomics in the energy field, I'll briefly touch upon that, and networking and distributed computing. This is not just the United States. It started 
in New York in pulling electricity from Niagara Falls to New York City. That's how it started. But it has spread worldwide, and it is considered the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century by the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. Now, if you look at this picture, the world did not look like, look like this 100 years ago. So in 100 years, it has transformed, and we run our motors, we run our lights, uh, we operate our lights using electricity. But if you just step back for a moment, there's something that is very noticeable. It is if you overlay the population on this electricity infrastructure, there's something striking that happens. The red is the population, the lights is where the electricity is. And clearly you realize that the um, electricity and population do not correlate. And so we are now relying on the electricity use on an architecture that is about 100 years old. And that architecture goes back to Tesla and Edison. Okay, it's, it's not the actual devices, but the architecture. And what do I mean by that? It is the paradigm of centralized electricity generation and then a long-distance transmission. Centralized generation normally from away from population centers. Long-distance transmission at high voltage so that you reduce the losses. And then locally, a distribution network, which is typically a branch network. The, the transmission network, the high-voltage transmission in the United States is a mesh network. That's the architecture. And the question is, will the rest of the world get this? Well, some of it has already gotten, but here are some numbers. The 3 billion people who have either no or very limited access to electricity today, by 2100, another 3 billion people will be added to the same regions. And by 2050, in some of the young people's lifetime, not mine, uh, that will be another 2 billion, and another billion will be added uh, in the last 50 years of this, of this century. And there's going to be massive levels of urbanization that will occur in developing countries. And without the electricity, they will not have access to information, very limited access to information. So the question is, how good is this architecture of, uh, of, um, of Tesla and Edison? It has been immensely successful, which is why it is called the greatest engin engineering achievement of the 20th century. What about the 21st? Well, there are some issues I'm going to talk about. It's been widely successful, but there are some issues that we have to realize. And, in, and the idea is that this, is, has to, this electricity infrastructure has to balance between supply and load at every instant of time. Because okay, so every time you flip off a switch, flip on, something is changing. And sometimes that system does not quite balance out. And this leads to significant amount of, uh, of pain. This is the 2003 Northeast blackout. And at the bottom plot is the frequency as a function of time. And frequency is a proxy for load and, and generation uh, mismatch. So what happened in this case was that a particular transmission line, which was going to New York, and that was a connection to, to Canada, uh, something happened in one of the transmission lines. And so there was sloshing of power from PJM into New York, and then sloshing back. There was all this power going on, the frequency going up and down. And finally, uh, it's not just one line, but multiple lines started tripping, and there was a cascading failure. Okay, so that's what happened. So we learned a lot. At least we thought we learned a lot. But about a couple of years ago, we had the San Diego blackout in 2011. And what we realized is what were the lessons learned? Not much. Because the problem was exactly the, almost exactly the same. There was a transmission line coming from Arizona with high voltage, really high voltage transmission, which tripped. Power went to the sort of lower voltage trans transmission. And then in this case, there was a nuclear plant in San Onofre uh, that had to be curtailed, and thereby San Diego lost power. Okay, so this is what happened. And if you look at the actual data, um, we have about, about one and a half to two hours of outage on an average uh, across the United States, and we lose about $100 billion a year. That's the infrastructure that we are relying on today for computing. This is a very big deal, uh, at least for Google, because the, the power supply, electricity supply, is very, very important. If you think this is one of the issues, let me give you another. And this is really scary. And that is cyber physical security. I'll give you one example that happened 
um, not too far from here. And if you if you go from San Jose, if you go down 101 towards Morgan Hill, you'll find on the right hand side there's a power substation called the Metcalf substation. And on the map, it, it is, you know, this is 101 out here. There's some lakes out here. You can go fishing if you want. And here's the Metcalf substation. And here's Morgan Hill. This is San Jose. It turns out that at 2 a.m. on April 16th, these are the substation transformers, by the way. Uh, at 2 a.m. is uh, April 16th, this year, 120 rifle shots were fired at the radiators of the active transformers. So they had infrared cameras to figure out which were the active transformers. And, and that leaked about, there were 13 of them, and they identified them, and leaked about 50,000 gallons of cooling oil. The transformers used cooling oil for, you know, for keeping it cool. And if, if not, they trip because they heat up of the, all the, you know, histories and losses. But more than that, 15 minutes before that, the fiber optic and telephone cables were cut so that 911 was disabled. Okay, this just happened, you know, uh, a few, you know, 60 miles from here. And then you wonder, how come no one heard of it? I, hadn't, I didn't hear about it. No one heard about it. It is because it was within 24 hours of the Boston Marathon bombing. Whereas all the media was focused over there, this happened and no one heard about it. Now you wonder what the heck is going on. And we still don't know. In fact, there was a lot of, uh, in behind the scenes, a lot of hue and cry about how come the other ISOs and RTOs did not know about this. So this is, you know, this is happening. This can happen because these are widely exposed. And for the information industry, for data center, who are managing data centers, this is really critical because you could be brought down. Well, that is just, you know, that, that's one aspect. Of course, in we saw... Um, you know, this is happening, this is a super storm standy, and people resorted to what people would resort to, starting off the genset, gensets and, and charging the iPhones and uh, Androids, I would add. Um, and, but that's what happened. People went back to, the, you know, it, the grid just collapsed. And how badly was the collapse? Well, here it is. This is the data of the hundreds of thousands of customers as a function number of days after Sandy, and you find this is two weeks after Sandy, you still have about 47,000 people who did not have power. Okay, so this is the state of affairs, and there's a real strong look that is going on in New York about the whole utility structure. The institutions have to change, and they're looking at it as an open book. This ain't going down. Why? Because this is the data from weather-related. This is, came out from Energy Information Administration of the weather-related outages, and this keeps going up because we have some weather-related, climate-related problems uh, in the United in, in the world. To highlight what that is, let me just show you. I mean, we, we all know, and I don't have to convince this crowd about global warming. In some crowds, I do have to convince people, but not in this one. But here is something that most people um, miss. We know that the world has warmed up 0.8 degrees above normal, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that's the average. The average has gone up by 0.8. But average is just the small part of the story. It is the distribution that matters. And I'll show you the distribution of the deviation from the normal across the world. And this is as a function of the standard deviation. It's a Gaussian, you'll see. And it's normalized in terms of you know, Gaussian standard deviation on the x-axis. And you'll find the red... Is, is the hot side and the cold, and the, and the blue is the cold side. And these are just the deviations from the normal. So what does it look like? Well, this is the theory. And now you'll see the movie of the temperature anomalies in the 50s and the 60s. Well, it's fairly balanced. You know, you got, you got some hot summers, you got some cold summers out here and across the world. And this is what happens in the 70s, 80s, 90s. And this is what we're seeing. So the trend is unmistakable. The average has certainly shifted by a small amount, but that's just, as I said, it's a small slice of the story because the tails are what are causing all the hot spots around the world. And you ask the question, where do they happen? What's the geographical distribution? It moves around. It's like a bubble in a carpet. You try to press it out here, it shows up somewhere else. And a few years ago, we had in Moscow, you know, like 100,000 people died. 
before that we had last year we had for example in the midwest which was worse than the um, the, the heat waves that we had, the dust bowl that we had in the 1930s. So that's, that's the climate aspect of it. So you now you put that all together and say, so where are we going? This trend is not changing unless we change fundamentally. So what is, how bad is it? Well, if you ask the question, how much CO2 have we emitted since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, since that's a cumulative effect, the answer is about a trillion tons. And this came out in the IPCC report as well. It's about a trillion tons. Some of it has gone down in the ocean, has been absorbed in the ocean, but a lot of it is still there. Then he asked the question, if business as usual, if you based on today's known fossil fuel reserves, if you take all the known reserves and burn it, how much more CO2 will we emit to the atmosphere? And that's a fair enough question. How much more CO2 can we emit based on known fossil fuel reserves? We just decide to burn everything. And the answer is about 3 trillion tons. And then the question is, how long would that take if based on today's economic growth, etc.? So the first trillion tons took 250 years. The next 3 trillion tons, how long would it take? And the answer is about 75 to 100 years. That's where we're going based on population growth, GDP per capita growth, etc. And so then you ask the question, oh my God, that's really fast. And, and how much is this worth? These, these uh, you know, three trillion tons of carbon in the form of fossil fuel, how much is it worth? And clearly the answer is about tens of trillions of dollars. Okay? So and here's the choice that is given to everyone. Is that should we keep those, those uh, three tens of trillions of dollars down the ground and not burn them because we want to save the environment and not use it for economic growth and save the environment? Or should we have the economic growth as business as usual and screw the environment? That's the choice that is given. And that is absolutely the false choice. And the best way to, to express that is, is this, that the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. is because we found better solution. We transitioned to better solution, which needs research, which needs in science and engineering to create those new solutions. So what are those solutions? Well, let me show you what we are doing in today's grid, which may, be, which may seem small, but it's still an effort towards going to better solution. What are they? Well, a grid today, we of course balance supply and load. Sometimes we falter, but most of the times it's fairly reliable. But we don't have any situational awareness on a transmission network. So what is going on? Well. This is what we have done over the Recovery Act that we had starting in 2009. There are about 900 what are called phaser measurement units that have been placed on a transmission network all over the country. And this, this is very important. This is the, now the first sort of measurement system. Imagine this is a, now infrastructure. We did not have measurement system all across the country. That was the state of the affairs. Now we have measurement units what does it measure? Well, we had measured that these phaser, phaser measurement units measures the current on the transmission line. The frequency, you know, 50, 60 hertz, our tolerance is 60 plus minus 036. Okay, that's the tolerance that we have in the United States. It measures time, of course, it's got a GPS, voltage, phase, and it samples every 30 milliseconds, and we got now petascale of data. And no one has figured out what to do with it. <laughs> Okay? We're supposed to have situational awareness. Well, it's there, but it's not quite. It hasn't been really used. We, of course, have improved communication. This, I mean, you all know this better than, better, better, better than me. All kinds of you know, low lat latency um, you know, protocols that have been used for, for really high-speed communication. And then we have cloud computing. Now, this is now the nexus. So there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to really understand how you could manage this grid and have situational awareness so that if some of these frequencies start, starts oscillating, you at least can do something about it and route the power in certain directions. And I say route the power in a transmission network. By the way, we don't have any routers. So that's the state of the electricity network. Now, that's, that's something that we can do, we are, we are doing right now, but there's a still a lot of work remaining, and I hope some of you can get excited about this to see what can big data do for the electricity network, which is absolutely fundamental for the information network. There are other things that are happening. There's some good, good news story. 
Let's talk about the cost of elect electricity generation because this is where, where economics come in and technology comes in. So the cheapest way to produce electricity is five cents a kilowatt hour. And that comes from the natural gas-based combined cycle turbines that are used to produce electricity. And why? Because natural gas is fairly cheap today in the United States and there's a lot of abundance. And secondly, the turbines that, we, that I'm talking about are more than 60% efficient. This is amazing technology that has been developed over decades. Now it's 60 plus percent. And so that gives you the cheapest way to produce electricity. What about the RELs? What about the renewable uh, technologies? Well, this is uh, solar and wind. Wind is actually cheaper than coal, new coal, in many parts of the country, which is why you get a lot of installation of wind going on. And so that's, that's great news. On the other hand, solar is not quite there, but it's getting there. It's dropping at a rate which is unprecedented. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But there's a, there's a difference out here. These are all centralized. This follows the paradigm of the Tesla Edison grid, which is a centralized generation, whereas these are distributed and modular. And that's a fundamental difference. And the question that everyone's asking is, what about the future cost of these electricity generation? What about grid integration? Because they're distributed. It defies the paradigm that we had in the past. Well, wind is already cheaper. What about solar? Well, this is the data on solar PV system. These, these are the cost of in fully installed systems. Not just the PV panel, the fully installed systems. So you can see this is residential, this is commercial, this is utility. And all of them have, have been coming down over the last, you know, three or four years. Okay, and at a rate which was, ne which, which was unthinkable before, due to a variety of reasons, some of it is engineering and innovation is manufacturing that has gone on. Some of it is global market dynamics. Okay, I won't go into the details of that. But it's important to note that most of the reduction has been because of the cost of the modules have been coming down. And the larger, the biggest cost today is not the module, but the balance of system. And the question is, how would you reduce the balance of system? What are the technological knobs? Well, the non-technological knob is, can you do inst installation properly? Can you have you know, permitting at a lower cost? Overhead rates should be lower, et cetera. Those are important. But in terms of technological knobs, efficiency is a big deal. Because if you go up in efficiency, you install less. Weight is a big deal. So how far we are we in the efficiency game? Well, this is efficiency. This is Shockley Quasar Limit. This is crystalline silicon. These are all the other uh, technologies that are there. And we are about a factor of two away. And so there is, let's put it this way, there's plenty of room at the top in this efficiency game. And thereby, you will, there, there's a very good chance that this is going to come down and get to a cost which is comparable to natural gas combined cycle. Now, I must point out out here that while this is in a crystalline silicon is about 24-25% production level, uh, Eli's uh, technology is you know, based on gallium arsenide on, on um, uh, in three five materials in, in broadly on, uh, on very lightweight substrates. Now, I made the mistake at many of the meetings of pointing out that that's 28% efficient, and he corrected me. It's not 28%, but 28.8%. And so I'm, I'm going to say that out here. It's 28.8% in single junction, which is amazing if you think about it. But that's, um, in Alta devices, that's what they're, they're trying to make. So this is all great. Solar is, is, is coming down. The wind is cheap. It's cheaper than coal. So what's the problem? The problem is not really in cost because it's going to come down. It's how can we integrate onto the grid. So let me explain this. And it all comes down to how is electricity generation and use balanced in real time? I mentioned it's in real time. And the answer is most of it is not real time. Why? Because this is how it works today in today's grid. And I'm going to show you data from a typical day of a New England ISO. Now, you can take any ISO um, with system operators, independent system operators, and it's probably about the same. New England ISO, this is a typical day. Most of the electricity, about 13 gigawatts of electricity, is planned a day ahead. So today's electricity that we're getting was planned yesterday. Okay, so it's not real time. Then you have a 30-minute reserve. Then you have a 10-minute spinning reserve. Then you have a 10-minute you know, non-spinning reserve, which they can, it's like a jet engine. They crank it up. And then the real-time part is this frequency regulation reserve of 150 megawatts. 
So you got 13 gigawatts, which is planned ahead, and you got 150 megawatts, which is the real-time frequency regulation, because you want to keep the frequency, which is a proxy for imbalance, uh, within a certain range. That's how it works. And then we have centralized ISOs. These are the typical you know, control panels, uh, centralized control. And you, you essentially have generation, you have load, you have to maintain the voltages out here. And this is a big NP hard problem, frankly. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we have no control of where the electricity flows. There are no routers. So electricity flows, go, flows down as if there's water down a hill. That's how it works today. And now you're trying to integrate these intermittent resources, and we today the total renewable of wind and, and solar, mostly wind, is about 3 to 4% of the whole electricity use, and we have no idea how to get there beyond 20% in the United States. In Ireland, Germany, it's a different question, but they have their own problems. In the United States, we don't have any idea how to get there because the dispatch process is not, you know, is not, you know, in, uh, does not enable these kinds of sources to be integrated. Well, so what about storage? Well, certainly grid-level storage. Grid-level storage, the, the, the biggest way to store, the cheapest way to store electricity is pumped hydro today, mostly in the Northwest. And that cost, it's all a cost. The, the upfront capital cost, not the levelized cost, but the up, upfront capital cost is about $100 a kilowatt hour. So that's typically where it is. And most of the other battery technologies were in the order of $1,000 a kilowatt hour. So we create some programs in RPE to bring down the cost. Out of that, these are early stages. Lots of very interesting technologies coming out. Uh, zinc manganese, manganese oxide from City College in New York, which got transitioned to a startup company. Um, this is fluidic energy that came out of uh, Arizona State. Uh, a rechargeable zinc air battery. This came out of MIT, uh, a, a lithium-ion flow battery, and Primus Power right here, a zinc-based battery right here uh, in Hayward. And there are many others. They're all going to compete, and they're all shooting for this $100 a kilowatt hour because if you can get there, this is the additional levelized cost is about $0.02 cents a kilowatt hour, and that is, is a big deal because now with the generation plus the storage, it's still affordable based on grid electricity today. So this is happening. So this is very good news. It's not quite there yet, but it's happening. Then, of course, there's another revolution that is starting, or we, early days of that, and that's in power electronics. I showed you this picture of the transformer earlier. The average age of these transformers in the United States is 42 years, and the expected life is 40 years. And so that's, that's the, we are living on borrowed time. And the other part of it is that you know, they are, most of it, the backlog is about four to six months. So we said that could we do better in terms of power conversion in going from low voltage to high voltage, AC to DC, DC to AC, etc. And, and um, one of the areas is, of course, power electronics. And, but this is not silicon-based. It has to be based on wide band gap semiconductors like silicon carbide or gallium nitride. At the low power level or medium voltage level, it can be gallium nitride, but at the higher voltage level, it probably has to be silicon carbide. This is one example that I often show. This is a single um, transistor, silicon carbide IGBT, which is 15 kilovolts. It drops 15 kilovolts over 200 microns of silicon carbide. So it better not have any defects or dislocations, otherwise it's good to latch up in these. And it can, it can manage 100 amps. So it's 1.5 megawatts of, of power, electrical power, going through a single transistor. And they're trying to modulate this at 50 kilohertz. You can have a switch mode power conversion circuit. And the, if you can do that, all the filters, the LC filters, now re reduce in size because now the frequency has gone up by a factor of 1,000, and thereby everything goes, becomes shrinks. And the biggest cost often is the metal for the inductors. And so if that goes down, the system cost goes down, even though the individual transistors will be more costly than the silicon. So this is happening, and you know, they're, they're, their goal is that if you can, can do this, uh, they can reduce the 8,000 pound transist, uh, uh, transformer to about 100 pounds transformer. This is solid state transformer, which is, you know, which is happening now, starting to happen. So this is another electronics aspect of it. The tremendous amount of power dissipation issues out here, and those of you who are interested in that, I can chat with you later. So if you look at all this now, there's some very interesting, in looking at the problems that we're having with the grid, the current situation, the architecture of 100 years old, the climate issues that are happening, the architecture itself, you know, if you, you know, bust a distribution line, the whole distribution feeder line goes away. There are lots of, you know, fault tolerance issues out here. 
if you look at all the all that is happening, let me put you, give you this techno-economic convergence that is happening. This is the cost of of solar that is coming down, and these are projections that are happening. And you see this little bump in 2016. That's because the subsidy or or the investment tax credit for solar is going to go down from 30% to 10%. So this is going to go up a little bit. But regardless, that's what the projection is. This is U.S. grid average. This is California. This is New York. This is Hawaii. Okay, and see where this is going. And that is, you know, it's it's a trend. The storage costs are going down. Um, uh, this is lithium ion, primarily driven by electric vehicles. This is wideband gap semiconductor based power electronics that is happening. And this is now, uh, you know, telecom penetration across the world is widely available. Now, Tesla and Edison had none of these. And then you ask the question, on to put on top of that, you have net network dis distributed secure computing. And again, Tesla and Edison, none of this. The question one has to ask is what grid would you make if you were to have this, if you were to start from clean sheet? because that's the, perhaps the grid that the rest of the world ought to be having as opposed to the grid that we are stringing along from the previous century. So I, you know, I, I, I want to end this talk with a little bit an attempt to, of humor out here. This is what we talked about, that you know, we transition to better solution. I, and I, given the situation, which is kind of pessimistic, I, I hope I showed you some optimistic uh, situation out here, a better solution. But here is the problem if you try to get these better solutions into the market. Better solutions are often disruptive innovations. And disruptive potential is very difficult to recognize early stages. So we see these trends going, and I'm showing you a, a glimpse, a snapshot today, but things are moving in a certain direction. The question is, what's going to happen in the future? Really, we cannot predict. But we can see that there may be some disruption in the future. And this is very difficult to predict right now. Uh, for anyone, and we did not quite predict the way the internet revolution really happened. So I'm going to, you know, show you some examples of why this is difficult, and people have fallen flat and on the faces in the past. This is an, a quote by Sir William Priest of the Chief Engineer British Post: "The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys." Um, but this is from a real scientist. Um, you know, this is from Lord Kelvin. Radio has no future. X-rays will prove to be a hoax. Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. He was opinionated, but he was wrong. <laughs> but he was not the only one. He seemed to have convinced someone who knows about flying, uh, as Wilbur Wright, who in 1901 said man will not fly for 50 years. I'm glad he did not take himself too seriously about this. This one is a long one, but I'll read it out. To place a man in a multi-stage rocket and project him into the controlling gravitational field of the moon where the passengers can make scientific observation, perhaps land alive, and then return to Earth, all that constitutes a wild dream worthy of Jules Verne. I am bold enough to say that such a man-made voyage will never occur regardless of all the future advances. This is the inventor of the vacuum tube in 1957. So this, you know, this happens all the time, and I'm sure someone saying that you know all this, the new grid architecture is, is not, not going to happen. But the only thing I would say is that you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And I think there's this need for magic right now in the electricity sector if you are to sustain the information revolution that we're seeing today. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. To answer some questions. Sure, I'm happy to. So Arun is happy to take questions. And... Oh. In fact, I have two questions. Um, first, you mentioned that in the U.S. you would only have up to 20 percent um, of renewables. Then you would uh, run out of steam. What about the? Did I? No, no, no. no? So let me. So, let me okay, uh, that's misunderstanding. Yeah, let I'm me glad that, that it's a misunderstanding. We love to have 80%. In fact, there's a National Renewable Electri Energy Labs report that came out last year saying that we, have, we can have the wind capacity of 80% electricity by 2050. The problem is not the capacity build-out. The problem is integrating onto the grid. Okay, yeah, thanks. Because the frequency Everything tolerance is, is yep. so small, it's very hard to take intermittent yep. resources uh, generation resource yeah. and try to integrate that. Understood completely. Um, thing, uh, the, the other question is seasonal st uh, storage. You mentioned storage and you mentioned improved batteries and so on. 
did anybody calculate how much lithium you need for seasonal storage, uh, tw uh, 30 days, 60 days storage if you have no wind and no sun? Yeah, I don't think these large gigawatt hour scale batteries are going to be lithium based. Yeah. Because lithium is great for high energy density, but in a stationary storage, it's not going to be, energy density doesn't matter. So those are mostly going to be made out of, we are looking at zinc and manganese, which are fairly mm. earth, okay. earth abundant. So I don't think lithium is, is going to play out. That's my guess. I may be proven and wrong like all these other you know, you and know, you illustrious people have. But you <laughs> did not mention at all uh, the power to gas, so electro electrolysis um, and uh, hydrogen generation and storage of hydrogen in uh, gas uh, caverns. Um, you didn't mention that at all. Compressed air. Uh, there's a compressed, compressed air. Compressed air. Hydrogen. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of work that's going on in compressed air. In Instead caverns. of hydrogen. Uh, you can produce hydrogen as well and mm -hmm. use that in fuel cells. It's all at the, at, at the end of the day a cost, a dollars per kilowatt hour. And if people can generate hydrogen and, and use it and produce electricity with a round trip efficiency of about 80% um, at $100 a kilowatt hour capital cost, absolutely, that's the way to go. Okay. But it's not possible Thanks. today. Mm -hmm. And so that's where research comes in. Yeah. I have a question <clears throat> talking about innovative magic. Can you share any Insights on what innovative magic might be going on in the four-story barge in San Francisco Bay? The Google barge? Uh, there's a Google barge in uh, San Francisco Bay that has uh, gotten in the news uh, this past weekend. I have no idea. <laughs> I, I was just curious if you had thought at all about these many nuclear uh, sources of electricity that are not power plants as such, but small enough to be at a house or something like that? House is, I, I haven't quite looked into the house part, but I think there's a, and so when, when I was at the DOE, uh, we started this whole movement towards small modular reactors. Typically, just to give you a little idea, for those of you who are not familiar, a typical nuclear reactor is about a gigawatt of power capacity and costs anywhere from seven to ten billion dollars. So anyone wants to go nuclear, they essentially put their utility has to put their whole bank account on on the table, and that is very financially risky. So the drive has been purely because of financial risk and nothing to do with technology. Uh, you know, we are now going as a nation towards small modular reactors, which is about 100 to 200 megawatts, so that it costs about a billion dollars, or hopefully less, because it's modular. Um, and, and thereby reduce the financial risk. And that's the trend that we, is, that we are going to see now. Uh, it's not, the technology is still like what a reactor. It's not going to be anything new uh, because the technology risk is minimized. I mean, you have to realize, as some of you may know, the, the nuclear industry is extremely risk averse, extremely, and, and rightly so in many cases. And, but that's the, the financial risk which is uh, being reduced right now, not the technology risk. There are some other ideas out there. I'd love to chat with you about that offline. Uh, Arun, um, about a year ago there was a slide going around showing that Germany for one Sunday in the spring had uh, its entire uh, electricity needs powered by solar photovoltaics. There's a recent news announcement that in Scotland 20% of the energy is coming from renewables. So what's different about Germany and Scotland? Um, I don't know the exact details of Germany and Scotland. I know about Ireland. So for the Scottish people, I'm talking, going to talk about Ireland now. Um, the reason, so Ireland has a wind, it is one balancing authority. It has a wind capacity that can go up to 40 to 50 percent, whereas we cannot. But their frequency tolerance is much wider than ours. So it allows... In, in one balancing authority, we have, I don't know how many balancing authorities in the United States. If you have one balancing authority, then it's much easier to integrate, especially when your frequency tolerance is higher. Because frequency, again, is a proxy for the imbalance between supply and load. So if you can, if you can tolerate a little bit of droop um, in the frequency, you can allow things to be integrated, even though the supply and load are not quite balanced. And so that, that really helps. Now, I don't know what the frequency tolerance is in Germany. 
are probably a little bit larger than what we have in the United States. We have 60 hertz plus minus 0 0.036 hertz. And from what I'm told, I'm looking at the history of this, it, it most likely because we used to run our clocks using 60 hertz electricity. And uh, that I'm still trying to find whether that's a real reason or not. But all our appliance and everything is standardized across, based on that. Uh, you mentioned actually uh, about uh, integration of uh, renewable energy to the grid, and that's not completely real time. Uh, so uh, I just wonder uh, what is your opinion about how how this can be done real time, and how uh, you know what happened, for example, for Google Power Meter, uh, and uh, how this can uh, be you know how this integration can be done in real time? No, the integration is done real time. Don't get me wrong, because it has to be balanced in real time. It is just that it's very difficult to go beyond a certain percentage of penetration. Uh, today, wind electricity is about 3 to 4%, 3.5% or so. But to go beyond that, beyond 20%, and to be able to take intermittent resources which you cannot dispatch properly the previous day, it's very hard to go to that kind of magnitude. You have to be in a different kind of market then. And so that's the real problem. It's not that we cannot integrate. It's that integrating intermittent, which are not quite predictable to exactly what kind of power you're going to generate, that's very hard, given our system. Um, the power meter is a, you know, from what I'm learning, is a, is a very specific example of measuring power at the consumer end, which is what we are now calling the, the smart meter. Uh, you know, that really you know, measures... Uh, the voltage, frequency, power consumption, phase angle, etc., at the consumer end, and and you know, informs the utility. So it's just a sensor, you know, more sophisticated than that. But it's at the end of the sensor, which is the equivalent of the PMUs for the transmission grid. You got the smart meters at the consumer end. That's what it is. We haven't quite used all that information, not just to do demand response. We can do demand response, but to do supply response, which is what I was talking about. Real time talking between the generation side and the load side and adapting in an automated way. We don't have that today. Yeah, Richard Feynman used to say the only thing that we know about energy is that it's conserved. So in the present paradigm, energy is transformed from one form to the other in one place, and then it is distributed all around. So you seem to suggest that the other paradigm in which energy is basically transformed where and when necessary will be the winning one. But then there is a problem of networking, even locally. So can you comment a little bit on, more on this topic? Well, I, I think the paradigm of centralized electricity generation is going to be challenged because distributed electricity generation uh, from solar and other sources is it will be cheaper. It's just a purely economic means. And right now it's small, but we are seeing the, the uptake and the trends of the uptake of solar, etc. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's climbing. Um, for people who do not have access to electricity at all today, or very marginal access, especially in the tropics, uh, you know, if you can put a solar panel up, and you're going to get electricity for the first time. That's a big deal. Now, whether you can string out the Tesla Edison grid to those 3 billion people, I don't know whether it's going to be possible or not at a rate that is determined by local governments. I don't know that, whether that's going to happen, or whether it'll be faster to put someone put a, puts up a solar panel and string out wires and generates electricity for the people to charge up their cell phones and their LED lights. That's maybe a different paradigm that may happen. So that paradigm of centralized generation and distribution, the transmission distribution, will be, will be questioned now in the next few decades to come. So just to bring it back to the uh, topic of uh, the conference, yes. uh, I'm sure that uh, Google has uh, backup generators. But if a data center would go down, how long would it take to reboot? <laughs> <laughs> I can connect you with the right people at Google <laughs> to answer that question. I don't know that. But we do have backup generators. Okay. I think we've uh, run out of time for the question period. Uh, but uh, let me suggest uh, maybe you can uh, trap Arun on his way uh, uh, out to coffee. <laughs>